Good one, or let's answer that one. All right. So I, I like to introduce you all to the the infamous Roger Stevens from the rock group Blind Melon, and now the uprising group Extra Virgin. What's going on, Rogers? Uh, back from the piano. <laughs> All right, so, all right, first question, all right. What was the first time Blind Mountain ever played live? Um, funny uh, enough, I'm playing with uh, the bass player in the band that I'm playing with now. Mm-hmm. It was, uh, we opened for his band yeah. at a club in L.A. Yeah. called Club With No Name, if I remember correctly. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it was pretty uh, chaotic. They were a really big band there, so there were a lot of people there. Yeah. Were you guys scared? Did you have that stage fright at the first time you ever got up? But I had any kind of a you know stage fright too yeah. bad really, uh, because I don't know. I guess I was just young and didn't really know any better. Maybe I should have been scared. <laughs> all right. Did Did you guys ever think you guys were going to make it? Considering you guys were all from like small towns, you know, you know, you from you're from Mississippi, right? You know, when you're yeah, at that point to move to California and try to do what we were doing, we just assumed it. We had. You know, it was like there was no question in our minds. You know, looking back on it, it's a kind of a, you know, it's, I realize now how lucky and how, yeah, and you know, how much other stuff fell into place out of sheer luck for that <laughs> to happen. But we weren't really living in reality at that point. Yeah, but you, so you guys moved from California to uh, North Carolina to record the self-titled, right? Uh, we we moved to North Carolina to get away from L.A. Yeah, the sleepy house. Right, I mean, that's where we kind of worked and wrote maybe half the stuff on that first record. Yeah, so how was it different recording the, the self-title than from Sue? Was it like a different vibe, you know, different towns, different vibe? Yeah, I mean, well, we, you know, we did the, uh, uh, we did the first record, we actually recorded it in Seattle. Yeah. Uh, we went, you know, we were working in North Carolina and the producer that we worked with, he had a studio in Seattle, so we just went there. You guys mixed it there then? But we just went there to Seattle to, to do it. And then, uh, I mean, the difference for Soup was pretty dramatic because at that point we had become successful and yeah. there was a lot more, I guess, expectations about what we were going to do. Yeah, or do, do you guys work with, like, different stuff, different recording? Or a lot more opinions. Yeah. All right. What, was Andy Wallace such a weird ass as you guys portrayed in the video? We're not that. Oh, no, 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 no. Andy's like. <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of why we did that to him. <laughs> so who was up doing that? Put Andy, you're going to do this interview <laughs> now, and uh, here, wear this. <laughs> so uh, he, you know, he had to do that. To <laughs> kicks, but he's no, he's a totally. He's a cool guy, man. Decent guy, yeah. All right, all right. Did Glenn use all, like his own custom kit, or did he have like a drum tech help him put his uh? the sound together, that unique drum set that he had? Uh, Glenn was very, uh, his, his drums were something that he developed over years. That's uh, he used a lot of old drums. Phenomenal, man. A lot of, uh, you know, old Ludwigs and Slingerland drums, and, uh, he just sort of frankenstein it in the end. Yeah. Just, you know, ended up with a bunch of old drums and, you know, found the ones that were put together. He was really pretty obsessive about it, much more yeah. so than most well, drummers that I've been in. You know, have, have played with or seen in rock bands. Yeah, with all vintage drums. Then he was. Yeah, he was but a vintage you know, guy. he's got really good sounds. He oh yeah, man. He knew how to tune his drums. Which yeah. Is kind of. You know. <laughs> difficult thing to do. Yeah, so where did the name Blind Melon come from? Was it the uh, the Cheech and Chong uh, Blind Melon Chitlin thing, or indirectly it came from that? Yeah. Yeah, indirectly it came from that. Yeah, uh, it was just you know something Brad heard <laughs> growing up as a kid. So. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> You know, why not that? Yeah, that, that's anything, I guess. Yeah. Uh, so, how long did it take actually to take uh, re- to record the Soup album? You know, since Shannon was arrested and all that stuff. It took a lot longer than it should have. <laughs> <laughs> it took about two and a half months or three months, beginning to end, from the day we walked in the studio to the day we were done mixing it. We mixed it in New York. Oh wow! So, see, I didn't know that. Yeah, we finished <laughs> it. You know, down there, we finished all the tracking down there, and then came up to New York and mixed it at. Uh, forgot the name of the place that's right on Broadway there 23rd oh, yeah. Street cool. so whose idea was it to uh, cover Candy Says the Velvet Underground was that uh, Shannon's idea that was Shannon's idea he's yeah. really into the, he was really into the Velvet Underground so yeah. you know, I, so I mean, I, we were all yeah. into it but you know he really wanted to cover the song and it was one of those it's things a great that song. kind of came together because he started playing it in a show one time and we just kind of filled in you oh, know wow. I mean it wasn't really I mean it you know, looking back on it, we could have made it much better, but uh, that was done on the radio, sta- radio station, I 
think. Yeah, then you guys put it on the Cowboy Way soundtrack, I think. Yeah. Something like so that. We did it in, I don't know, we did it in like a couple of hours at a radio station. Oh, wow. Somewhere, I can't remember, it was in Holland or something. Holland? Oh, sweet Jesus, that's cool. So, uh, how'd you guys score the uh, track on the Schoolhouse Rock, the Three's Magic Number? Well, we've been wanting to cover that for a long time. Uh, Is that the same thing, Shannon, play, we played it live or something like that? You guys would play it live or something like that? No, that was more Glenn's doing. Uh, uh, you know, he had we had the tapes. He had he had all the tapes recorded, uh, like the, uh, the the odd the visuals, the videotapes yeah. of all the cartoons. You know, and everybody remembers them yeah, when we were kids. Exactly. So, uh, you know, we had talked about it a bunch over the years that we were going to do one of the songs. I mean, and then you know the, the opportunity came up. They were doing the tribute record, and we jumped on it. And we picked that song before anybody had a chance yeah. to do it. And. Um, you know that we we did it here in New York as well. With this, uh, this guy Donald Fagan, who is in Steely Dan, his studio. Oh, wow. Um, and uh, it, you know that was a one day thing, and it just it sort of came off as just one of those lucky special recordings. Yeah. So was uh the out on the tiles the Zeppelin? Okay. How was it like being not swapped by uh, royalties and all that stuff? Actually, being able to cover a Led Zeppelin song. Um. You know that that was that was another thing they asked us to do. Robert Plant used to yeah. come to some of our shows in England, oh, wow. and he really liked the band. And uh, uh, so he they they asked us to do it, and, and we thought, well, you know, we'll try something that's less obvious. You know, yeah. we picked out on the tiles, yeah, and that's... we got Eddie Kramer to produce it, who did you know engineer it on yeah. the original record, mm-hmm. on the Led Zeppelin records, and uh, it was you know it didn't that, that was one of the ones that I really don't put on to listen to you know I don't think it's that great yeah uh, I, I in my opinion you guys uh, rocked that song out better than uh, Zeppelin did actually uh, I don't know about that <laughs> <laughs> that's a threat that's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I take that back then okay Roger. you should take that back <laughs> okay be ashamed of yourself <laughs> so as the remaining members of, of Melon have uh, have they played have you guys played together since last show At um one? just like a couple of things like you know when Brad got married we played his wedding with the wedding band oh wow and uh last year uh this photographer who took a lot of the pictures that you would see of us named Danny Clinch yeah. he um like he took the pictures for the soup album the cover and all that stuff oh, wow. which is Andy on the cover Andy Wallace yeah um he was having a party for a release of his book here in New York uh-huh. so and Rennie and I who's the singer and extra virgin mm-hmm. we were playing at his party and they came to the party and we all played together that, and cool. uh, they played with Rennie and I would you guys cover old melon songs or what uh, no we did some oh. of the uh, extra virgin songs oh wow that's, that's kick ass man so that was that we played for like 20 minutes and it was really cool and Glenn was here it was great so what's your definition on uh, radio's uh, thing of rock now you know what's their what do you think of that the definition of rock nowadays um, it doesn't really hold my interest. Yeah. Um, you know, but uh, it's, it, when I was, you know, 13 years old, I listened to Motley Crue obsessively, you know? So it, there was nobody that was 30 years old like <laughs> I am that was into it, you know? <laughs> so it's the same thing, you know? It's people, uh, you know, it's, it's primarily for, for, you know, I guess maybe it's younger people who are, who are buying it. Yeah. But that's, that's great. I'm, you yeah. know, whatever. If that's what they get off on and that's cool I don't really have a problem with it or anything and to me for my ear it's, it's not where I'm at personally though alright so how long has Extra Virgin been in a like total progress now like um about six months six months the actual band yeah so was it like magical as when M- Melon was created or what no it's a total pain in the ass oh for real it's a complete pain in the ass but it works and, it and works. when it works and when it's on stage it makes it all worth it being here in New York is 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 one of the contributing factors to that. It's a different experience than anything I've ever been through, because here, everything this, this city is just brutal. Yeah. I mean, to get anything going here is ruthless because every night that you play, you're up against, uh, you know, every big band, national band. You know, there's somebody's playing in town. Plus, there's 50 other local bands, and some of them are quite good. So, yeah. you know, there's a lot of competition. It's a lot of uh, work to get your niche going, and, yeah, and, yeah. and we really developed that our last few shows. Packed and packed. But it, it's you know, if we were living north in North Carolina or Seattle or somewhere like that, we would have you know a much bigger following. Yeah, exactly. Because all the I really believe that you guys got like a total different scene in New York and 
Well, there's a lot of underground hey, clubs. You're playing on the national stage here in New York. Yeah. You know, it's not like, you know, this is sort of the hub of, of yeah. media and record companies and all that sort of crap. So uh, <laughs> it, the competition here is, is the most brutal that it will be anywhere. I mean, if you really think about it, how many, you know, bands are from New York? I mean, you got the Rolling Zones and Blondie and Talking Heads and yeah. Velvet Underground and, you know, and there's a few others. And then it's like, <laughs> oh, it's disproportionate to the amount, the amount of people who are here trying it. I saw sort of sound size to the Okay. Alright, From which. Okay. Okay. So now you guys are getting attention. Are, are you guys going. Are you going to do anything different that you did before from when you were with uh, Blind Melon? Um, in what way? I mean, as in. You know, get not get your name out there. Are you guys, you guys, going to take any cheat ways, anything like that? Um, well, I don't know. I mean, what's what's happening is basically is there's there's you know all the record companies are coming to our shows and checking us out now. So over the next few months, we'll sign a deal and go out and make a record. Right you know, it'll be and and it'll get the whole thing. You know, we'll do we'll make an album, we'll promote it, we'll tour and do all that. You know, but now you know where we are now. There's so much new stuff that we've written yeah. that um, you know we'll be moving on with a new record on a major label I mean by the time this goes down you know the, the, the first record that we did will be a year old yeah were you saying Epic before that you were gonna is that who's looking at you guys right now what who's looking at you guys right now who's, who's looking at us yeah like a, as in labels and stuff uh, a lot of them yeah you know most of them I would say Capital ever come back to you guys come back to you uh, Capital is one that hasn't uh and I, I don't know, you know, if they've even been approached or whatever. I mean, yeah. it's, it's, you know, it's a whole new regime there. And none of the people who were there when we were there are still there. So uh, it's, uh, you know, if Capital came to us, be more than willing to hear what they have to say because it's, you know, it's a whole different group of people. All it is is the name, you know. Yeah, exactly. It's no different. <laughs> so what's your life goal? Are, are you, have you already achieved it? What's my goal? Yeah. All right. All right. Was it touring with the Stones? Uh, I don't know. I don't. Really, I don't guess. I really think so much in those terms. Yeah. Maybe at one point that I did, I wanted to be successful. But then when when you know Blind Melon was successful, uh, then I guess that didn't really do it. You know. So I, I stopped kind of placing those things. I mean, I just try to try to work and and uh, and 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 write music and make attempts at being creative. You know, and any anything else. That yeah. So do you live out your arena rock fantasies then? What? Do you live out your uh, arena rock fantasies? <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty much without those. I mean, <laughs> I, I like to play live, and I like to play in front of people, and there's yeah. it's definitely a rush, but it's not my main motivation for being in this, and it never has been. Yeah. I mean, my, my main motivation is, is, is to try to... I, I get more of a thrill in the studio and having this stuff and listening to stuff back on tape than I do playing live. Yeah. You know, it's mostly kind of the, the thing is kind of going on in, in my head of what I'm getting off on. Okay, so while you guys were in Canada when you were uh, with Mello, what ticked Shannon off to pee on the crowd? And oh, we'll move on from that one. Oh, okay, all right. Well, that was just drunken stupidity is all that was. <laughs> it was my birthday. Yeah, yeah for real? So. Oh, my God. Okay, well, was most of Nico overdubs, or was it actually full band songs? Did you guys go do go back and find old tapes? There were a couple of songs. I think Soup and Swallowed yeah. were uh, from the Soup session. Oh, wow. That were done, really. And the other stuff was, uh, there was a, like three or four things, I can't remember which, that we did, me and Chad and Christopher did one time, and uh, uh, we were in Mammoth, California, at his uncle's cabin, at Christopher's uncle's cabin. And then uh, some stuff was done in the basement of a hotel in St. Louis, and we did overdubs on top of that. <laughs> so... Uh, there, you know, came out to be a nice album, like right? a song like Hell. That was nothing but Shannon and an acoustic yeah. guitar. We went in oh, and wow. Danny Clinch played harmonica on it. We put drums on it, guitar solos. The Pusher, I played the guitar solos on it, sure. the overdubs, and put the drums on, and that was that. Yeah. One that I could really tell though on a Nico album was Glitch. It was a like a yeah, really Glitch was layered just acoustic song. guitar and vocal. Yeah, and uh, yeah, we 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 overdubbed a lot on that. Yeah. We just had big percussion circles going. Yeah. What track? Do, uh, what kind of track recorders you guys use on that as in uh, on on what do you mean on Nico as in like the overdubs like 
you guys just it was like a big track and you put it whatever you yeah, we took the dat tapes we dumped them down onto a two inch tape in a, in a studio bad animal studios in seattle oh wow so those were in stereo on on a 24 track machine and then we had 22 tracks to fool around with oh wow so then it was just everything was put on like that yeah, exactly that, that. I mean, if you would have heard what the thing sounded like and how they ended up, it was a, it was a real magic thing. Yeah. We were it was one of the best experiences in recording I've ever had in my life. Just because we did it fast, it was inspired, we were ready to do it, yeah. you know. Well, how long did it take you guys to finish it? I mean, we probably finished it, mixed and everything in two weeks. Oh wow. Uh, I mean, the playing was that's, probably done in three days. Yeah, that's you know? quick work, man. I mean, but that included going through tasting and like listening and selecting things and then pulling things out and all that, you know, a lot of technical stuff as far as transferring tapes and all that. <laughs> so how was the vibe in Kingston Studios as you get... Kingsway. Kingsway, Kingsway, sorry, sorry. Kingsway is amazing. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's just, you feel like you're in a New Orleans whorehouse, you know, it's great. <laughs> uh, it's been, it just closed down. Yeah? Yeah. Oh, wow. Uh, it's owned by Dan Lenoir, who did, who's probably, he's, you know... You can count the really great producers on one hand or two hands, maybe, and I think he's one of them. He did like, uh, like he did the Joshua Tree, U two, uh, Joshua Tree, like Peter Gabriel, Sledgehammer, all that oh, stuff. Wow. He did the last Bob Dylan record. He's done tons of amazing sounding records. He did Amy, Amy Lou Harris record, Wrecking Ball, that is really great. All right, Roger. I'd like to say thank you and everybody. This is one of the best guitar players in the world. And <laughs> <laughs> He's got it. He's the god of guitar right now. <laughs> That's funny. I want everybody to go out and check out Extra Virgin. But they're all the way in New York, so everybody here in Indiana is kind of far off. So, All right, Roger, I'd like to say thanks again, man. All right. All right, man. Thank you. All right.